Now I'm not. Good. Good. Well, I'm glad there's still a few things that we still, even after literally hundreds of podcasts, hangouts, we still uh, make a few mistakes. Yes. But that's it. That'll be the only mistake for the episode. You've already. They, they uh, keep changing the interface. <laughs> That's true, they do. my interface alone. No, there must always be constant dramatic change. Progress no. marches on. No, it needs to stop. No, it'll never stop. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> hey, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you. This is going to be our last episode before, uh, before Christmas, but uh, we're probably going to keep going, right? I mean, next Monday yeah. it'll be like the 28th or something, 29th. Neither of us are traveling. No, and in fact... A year ago, we were just coming back from our cruise when we did the were Not we, the End of the World cruise. We flew home Christmas Eve, didn't we? We flew, we flew on Christmas Day. Yeah, That's so... It. Merry Christmas, kids. <laughs> this time last year, we were at the Miami Zoo. Well, no, no, we, we did that before. before. Yeah, no, we came we right off the cruise. We and... see The Hobbit this day last year. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen the new one yet? No, I'm... I'm uh, no. <laughs> really? That's our Christmas tradition. I need you to to because I've already seen it with the kids. Yeah, so. no, it's it's a matter of uh, I was planning to go Christmas Day. We have humans coming over Christmas Day, and so now I need to find a new day. Oh, Very going confusing. going to movies on Christmas Day is the best. I love yeah, doing it that. Really is. Yeah. Cool. So if. Uh, Hello to the people watching right now. If you've never done this before, this is going to be a live episode of Astronomy Cast. So we're going to record the show right now for you today. You're going to watch us make all of our mistakes. Um, well, no, we already made the mistakes. We can't make any more. Uh, and then uh, we finish that. It'll take us about 27.25 minutes to record the show. And then yeah. after that, <laughs> we'll stick around. Do you know how long I aim to make these shows? Do you have any idea? Between 26 and 28 minutes. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I try to aim them. If, if it's getting towards 27 minutes, I'm like, come on. <laughs> yeah, except you, you end at the same time marker. No matter how many times we apologize to Preston and the show has to get edited. Yeah, well, you know, so that's how we get shorter <laughs> shows. I, no, I do. I try to account for <laughs> if we made a bunch of mistakes early on, I try to let it run a little longer. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, who cares? Uh, so, um, right, so so we'll stick around after and we'll answer your questions about space and astronomy. And I think this one we're going to need a ton of questions because we're going to be doing a fairly hands-on kind of conversation and there's a lot of variables. And in audio. Of, in, in audio, which is going to make things harder. But uh, And in fact, I have props. So, so silly, for the folks who watch boy. this in video, we'll be able to, uh, to sort of show you. Yeah, it is fully assembled, unfortunately. Um, but so, you can show them on air how how easy it is during the question section to take a Galileo scope apart. Is that what you're going to make me do? You're going to make me take yes. my daughter's Galileo scope? Yes. She is going to kill me? No, it's just two rubber bands, and if you break one, hair elastics work better than the ones they ship with. Okay, all right. Well, we do, we do have a ton of those. Um, okay, so... Yeah, so we'll do, the, we'll do the episode, we'll stick around, we'll answer your questions about space and astronomy, and then you are free to enjoy your Christmas holidays. So, um, how are you doing there? You ready? Yeah. Okay, so am I. Should I press record? Um, yes, press okay. record. Okay, I'm pressing record, and it's recording. Nice. Um... There's my intro bit. All right, here we go. I'll bring it over here. Merry Christmas, Preston. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Preston. Awesome. All right. Astronomy Cast, episode 327, Telescope Making, part one. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Good. This is our, we are recording this episode shortly before Christmas, so by the time you receive this, there will have already been Christmas. Uh, as my husband put it this morning, it's Christmas Eve Eve. It's Christmas Eve Eve. It is the, what do you call it, the penultimate, after before penultimate? I call it the day that all of the baking occurs. We're making uh, truffles today. So that's the plan. Chocolate truffles. That is far more exciting. 
Uh, no, they're so easy. Um, they're super easy. So, uh, so hey, thanks to everybody for uh, for joining us over this entire year. We've we put a lot of effort into kind of keeping the schedule, and I hope you've noticed that. And uh, and I hope you enjoy everything we do for the next uh, for the next seventeen years of Astronomy Cast. <laughs> so consider that our, our our Christmas gift to you. And and I just have to say for those of you in the US who need that final tax deduction, because like me, you already plug things into Turbo Tax and went, oh blah. Too much. Um, How can yeah. I write some of this off? Yeah, so it, uh, you can donate to Astronomy Cast through SIUE. It's a 501c3 nonprofit and it is tax deductible where the law allows. Nice. All right, let's get rolling. So why pick up a low-quality, wobbly telescope from the department store when you can craft your own, just like Galileo and all the other great astronomers from history? For a minor investment, you can build a worthy telescope out of spare parts and high-quality kits. So uh, this is going to be a two-part episode, three-part episode, actually. We're going to do the first part today. We're going to talk about toys and kits and kind of the... Building playing telescopes, lenses. yeah, playing with lenses and building telescopes as an educational experience and just sort of starting to understand how optics work and being able to, to get into that. Part two, we're going to talk about the serious business of amateur telescope making, which, which is a way for you to really, you know, craft your own lenses and, and build the hardware. And, mirrors. And Don't mirror. make your own lenses. That hurts. <laughs> no, no, some people do it. And mirrors, build your own mirrors and, and build the hardware and select your mount and, and really get into the nuts and bolts of what it takes to actually make a telescope. Um, and then for part three, we're going to talk about building a space telescope, which I think is... Because really some exciting. people do that. I know. Awesome. Which, I mean, there have been a ton of really dramatic changes in the, uh, in the industry and they've enabled people to build their own space telescopes. So we're, we're going to get into sort of... We're, we're at the cutting edge of this right now, but so we'll, we'll do a lot of speculation and what's possible. Um, but uh, yeah, it's going to be pretty cool. All right, so, so let's get started then. So then let's say a person, you know, wants to build a telescope and I think to kind of get to, to get like what is the core parts of a telescope that people need to, to know about? Well, so, so there's a lot of different places to get started. And what I do with my students is I'll actually just, this is lame, but if I'm trying to explain how telescopes work so that they can get the sense of what they want to build, I'll go grab a pair of magnifying glasses, you know, the type that you use to set things on fire in the summer. I sure uh, do. <laughs> oh wait! Uh, you, you have children. You know how this works. <laughs> and, uh, and I had a childhood. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So, go grab yourself a pair of not identical magnifying glasses. So one like little tiny wussy doesn't magnify things very well. Preferably with like a nice big lens, and then a nice high power magnifying glass. Um, you can get these at any big box store. They sell them uh, for. Sewers, they sell, sell them for people who have trouble reading. They sell them in the kids' section. Just grab yourself a pair of cheap magnifying glasses. Then go find yourself either a pair of cardboard boxes or a pair of chunks of styrofoam and stabby the magnifying glasses in. And you can now start seeing how the lenses work at different distances. And the quick and easy way to understand the way light passes through a telescope is get a light with like an incandescent bulb where you can see the filament or a fluorescent bulb that has a neat spirally structure or something to it. Point one magnifying glass at that neat light source and let the light go through the lens and project it onto a piece of paper. And try moving the piece of paper back and forth until you get a nice crisp image of whatever it is you're looking at. And if there's two of you, you can actually play the game of, so if I pull the lamp further away from the lens, what happens to my image distance? And you can start to see how the equations for building a telescope work. Um, it's really kind of neat. And if you do this with both lenses, you can see not all lenses focus at the same distance. And this is why I like putting them in two boxes. So you can start out with the lenses side by side, looking at a light source, and see the differences side by side, and move 
the paper to get it right for both lenses and see the differences. And so really the most basic telescope of all is to just get those two magnifying glasses and and now you're recommending put them into a box so you can so something's holding them, but you can really just hold the two lenses, move them back and forth, and and start to get it see what that what that does and right. how you, you that changes. It's going to change the focus. It's going to change the distance. It's going to change the you know a bunch of parts of this, right? And and the neat thing about doing this. Uh, is is this whole idea of of using the piece of paper to pro project the image of the lamp you're looking at? If you separate the two lenses by the addition of those two distances, so like the distance lens one focuses at, the distance lens two focuses at, add those two numbers together and separate the lenses, and then stick your eyeball in, and now you have a telescope. Perfect. And so now the first time that you look through this handheld telescope, you're going to see something kind of surprising, right? Yeah, images don't necessarily um, stand up in the way you'd expect them to. So you're going to find that in the process of bending the light through the lens, um, the image gets flipped upside down, and that's kind of cool. Yeah, and why is that happening? It's, it's literally a matter of the light rays are getting flipped as they pass through the lens. So if, if you look at the lens and you think about it for a minute, no matter where you put your eye, you're going to be able to see that exact same light bulb. So there is a light ray going from the top of the light bulb to your eye. You move your eyeball left, there's a light ray moving from the top of the light bulb to your eye. Well, when the light rays go from the light bulb through the lens, the light bulb, the light bulb light ray that passes through the top of the lens is going to get bent down towards the middle. The light ray that goes through the middle of the lens um, straight on is going to just keep going nice and neatly straight through the lens. Um, and the process of doing this ends up flipping your image upside down because you're bending the ones that are further away from the center and the ones through the center get to go straight through. Okay, so let's make some modifications to this homemade telescope then. So right now we've bought two identically sized uh, lenses and we're going to get this sort of this flipped version and it's going to work like a rudimentary telescope. But what if we change the sizes of the, of the lenses? Um, are you changing the diameter, or are yeah, you changing? Yeah, yeah, I'm changing the diameter of the lenses, right? So, so this is one of those things that tends to confuse people. The diameter of the lens has nothing to do with anything. It changes how much light you're going to gather. So, a bigger lens, it's scooping up more light, but it doesn't change the magnification at all. What changes the magnification is how curved the surface of that lens is. So when you look at the surface of each lens, some of them appear completely flat, because they are. We call that a normal piece of glass. Um, but as you curve that surface more and more, it is going to bend the light more and more and more. And the more you bend the light, uh, that's going to end up magnifying the image even more. When you read um, focal lengths, on different lenses. For spherical lenses, that's actually the diameter of a circle that has that curvature for um, for the lens. And so if I have a... Uh, Not diameter, radius. It's the, the radius. radius. Right, it's right, the right. radius of curvature. Right, and so the... but the shorter the number, the smaller the number, the tighter that, that circle is going to be the shorter the focal length. Right. Because it's it's focusing closer in. Now do I want the you know, which one do I want in front? Do I want the <laughs> one that has more tighter you want, radius? You want the tighter radius one nearer your eyeball. So let's say you go to Amazon and I found out earlier today you can do this. If you go to Amazon you can buy all sorts of different lenses designed for playing with optics, designed for science fair projects. And if you buy yourself um, a 200 millimeter lens and a 100 millimeter lens, 
you want that 200 one up near the front and the 100 one up near your eye. And one neat thing you can do is if you buy lenses that have the same diameter, you can um, take two paper towel tubes and slot one of them and then just roll it ever so slightly so that it fits inside the other one. And you can fix those, if they're the correct size, lenses to the paper towel tubes. And the reason that you want the two of them is, as you learn if you try shifting where your lamp is compared to the lens, objects that are closer to you focus at a very different place than objects that are far away. And so as we move those lenses back and forth, we're getting the focal point in a different spot. As we bring them, I'm trying, trying to remember which way it goes, if we keep them farther apart, you're going to get some things in focus, you can bring closer apart, different things will be in focus. And so there so is no right distance. An, an object at infinity is going to focus at the focus length of the lens. So if I have a four millimeter lens, and it's manufactured correctly, and my eyeballs like the universe. Uh, when I use it to try and focus on something infinitely far away, it's going to focus four millimeters away from that lens. That is really cool. Okay, now, so as things come in from infinity, I get to move my eyeball back. And and literally, like a telescope is that is it, right? I mean, for for a for a lens-based telescope, I mean, there's all kinds of other stuff around it, but it's all just helping out these two lenses. Now what if we add another lens? Well it depends on what type of telescope you have. So in some cases you have to have another lens to try and correct for different flaws. Lens-based telescopes, and I think we did an entire episode on this ages back, lens-based telescopes, lenses by their nature focus different colors of light at slightly different distances. So when you look at the moon through lenses you end up seeing a slightly red edge and a slightly blue edge as it focuses the light. Um, it's more noticeable with stars than with the moon. Um, to correct for that focusing different colors at different distances, we start adding all sorts of different lenses in. There's other problems where sometimes the center of the lens is in perfect focus, but the outer edges of the lens aren't, um, just because of how the lens is made. Or, more to the point, what happens a lot is light that's coming in from the edge of the field of view is slightly out of focus. So the center of your field of view, perfectly in focus. Outskirts of your point of view, uh, now elongated. And all of these different effects are all different types of stigmatisms, just like your eye can get stigmatisms. And we correct for them in different ways, and one of those ways is just to add lens after lens after lens until that sucker has a perfect image. Right, and if each lens is very expensive to craft and grind and, and make, and then to to double or triple or quadruple, like you can see where the price of these high-end telescopes just goes up and up and up, because there's just more and more of these lenses trying to really clean up the light as it comes in. But, but one of the really awesome examples that allows you to see how all of these different lenses can work together is the Galileo scope. And this is a telescope you get to build for yourself. When you order one of these, an Oceanside, Oceanside Photo and Telescope, optcorp.com, who do not give us money, but we nope. simply like them a lot, um, they make these telescope. they don't make, they resell these telescopes they're fairly low cost and they are both a kit for learning optics and a really nifty telescope that you can mount on just an everyday camera tripod. And the lens in the front, the big light collecting lens, it's just a single lens. But the eyepieces are made of multiple different lenses pocketed together in different ways to correct for all of those different possible stigmatisms um, and to remagnify the field in different ways. And what's neat about how they built these telescopes is they come with a couple of different eyepieces. And one of the eyepiece configurations makes the telescope work just like Galileo's telescope. And you realize Galileo like did miraculous things because his lens was really terrible. And when you look through I never it, used, we never used that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you look through it, you can barely see. You have to get your eye in just the right place. And 
it's horrible. Um, and so when, when you're done, you have both a version of Galileo's telescope and then modern designs for lenses that allow you to take this, this small device and turn it into a powerful observing tool that allows you to make out the rings on Saturn and craters on the moon. And it's just a nice plastic telescope that literally if you drop it down the stairs, it might bounce apart. But it works kind of great. But like, what does a Galileo scope cost? Um, it depends on where you order it. A lot of times they're under fifty bucks. Yeah, and it is it is definitely the most affordable, high quality telescope that you can get your hands on. I mean, this was designed by an international team of astronomers who really know their stuff focused on like let's make the best possible telescope for the cheapest possible price so, yeah. so if you're looking to to get your hands on a on a telescope and to learn about optics and make a, you know make a telescope we can't recommend the Galileo scope highly enough and you know I, we end up with tons of them we give them away for for at various conventions yeah. and stuff cuz cuz you know we're always trying to get that telescope into people's hands and and I think my favorite moment with one of these was several years ago at uh, the Northeast Astronomical Forum, NEF. Uh, Al Nagler of Teleview Telescopes, who makes perhaps the best eyepieces that are publicly available. These these are eyepieces that cost as much as some telescopes cost and are worth every penny. Um, it's like you're he falling has, into space. <laughs> he he has uh, an eye for optics where he can look through things and really see the difference between different optical characteristics. And Rick Feinberg took over a Galileo scope for him to look through and pop one of his Teleview eyepieces on. And Al had the initial look of, yes, I'll do this, I'm amused, and then had the look of, oh, oh, wow, oh, okay. And and there's a quote on the Galileo Scope website of, of Al's actual words, but watching his reaction, it was one of those startled surprise of, that's far better than I anticipated. Like when a small child brings you cake and it looks okay, but you're not you haven't set your expectations too high and you taste in, taste it and it's like grandma's cake. Um, that was the reaction. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, you're looking at craters on the moon, you're looking at the rings of Saturn, you're seeing Jupiter's moons, you're seeing the bands across the planet Jupiter, you're seeing the Mars, the disk of Mars, maybe the, if it's close and bright, you're able to see the polar caps. If you're the seeing, season's right. Yeah, if you're seeing the crescent of Venus, mm -hmm. you're seeing some of the brighter um, deep sky objects. Globular and, clusters look yeah. awesome through it. Yeah, Andromeda, Galaxy, uh, the Orion Nebula, I mean there's a ton of stuff. And so so let's say, but you know, let's say you don't want to go the, the Galileo scope route, although we highly recommend it. What are some other kinds of kits that people can get their hands on? The, the other place to go look is Edmund Scientific. Their selection is constantly changing as different manufacturers change what they have. But Edmund Scientific is the place to go for tough, hard-to-kill educational supplies for all sciences. Astronomy, biology, I remember at one point when I was a kid for reasons that at the time were interesting, my parents ordered me a dead frog to dissect from Edmund Scientific. Um, so, so you can, yeah, yeah, you can get any educational science stuff from there, and they always have all the other stuff. But really, the Galileo scope is so much better than everything else out there. That's it. it there, there's other kits based out of Japan, a different version of the Galileo scope, um, but it. It isn't as rugged. Um, the Galileo scope was actually designed so you can repeatedly take it apart and put it back together. And all the others that I've encountered are designed, you put them together and you just sort of hope and wish the cardboard doesn't get bent. Galileo scope, I've seen kids use it to like mock sword fight 
and it survives. Occasionally, <laughs> you have to put it back together, find where the lenses went to, um, but it survives. That's, now, that's now we've talked about the Galileo scope, we've talked about this mode, which is this lens-based version of, of telescope. So, But there is a whole other class of telescopes, which are the Newtonians, right? Uh, created by our good friend Isaac Newton. So let's go back to the basics again. How, and this is tougher, but how can we sort of make a Newtonian telescope? Cosmetic mirror. So here, you, you actually want to, to, to play with it, play it off axis. So go get yourself a cosmetic mirror, one of the ones that completely magnifies. So if you want to count your eyelashes, you can. I don't know why you would, but you could. No, but like a shaving mirror, I understand. Yeah, yeah. shaving mirror, cosmetic mirror. Grab one of those, and first neat thing you can do with it is when you're close, you're right side up. And as you back away, there's this moment where suddenly you become upside down. The point between right side up and upside down is the focal length for that telescope. So what you want to figure out how to do is how to take that light and bend it so that you don't have your face in there, so that you can actually focus something from a distance. Right. It's strange. Everything I look at with my telescope looks like my face upside down. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right. So, so to go back to our styrofoam example, what you want to do here is, is put your cosmetic mirror, most of them come on a stand, and then go find yourself a little tiny flat mirror. A lot of wallets come with these, and you can just steal them out of the wallet and glue it on to a pair of shish kebab sticks mm, or... So you can jab it into your styrofoam as well. Jab okay. it into your styrofoam. And now what you want to do, and use the smallest mirror you can find, is take a nice big object in the distance, focus the light on to first the cosmetic mirror, then bounce it off of that flat mirror and tilt the flat mirror ever so slightly so you can put a piece of paper off to the side. And what's interesting with this is, like I said, there's this moment where things flip from right side up to upside down. This is because the images aren't quite the same here and you will need a lens in order to start focusing things. Right, and that was my question, right? With the with the original telescope, with the the refractor, you need the two lenses together. But in this case, you're going to need the mirror and then another lens. Yeah. And that and that in between mirror. So it's, really, it's three parts. Mm hmm You could really do with two parts, but everything you're going to see is just your magnified face. So go with three parts. Yes. Cosmetic mirror, uh, mirror to bounce the light, and then a lens to focus it. And and, and this get is everything strictly nicely for educational up. purposes. Cosmetic mirrors do not have good surfaces. They were not designed for astronomy. They were des designed for allowing men to shave and women to put on makeup. Um, different priorities? Yeah, it's not going to be really, really high quality. But, but you should get that same thing, which is that things far away, whatever that big mirror is pointed at, is going to look bigger. Mm -hmm. And... With this one, you actually have the ability, instead of focusing it on paper, to look into that mirror and see what happens and stick your eye in there and measure the distance from your eye to the mirror to the mirror to get the focal length. And another cool thing you can do is if, for whatever reason, you have a nice perfectly round container or at least perfectly round on the sides, um, fill it with water. And you can use that to focus the light onto your eye. So this is another case of you're looking through something and you get to see the magnification. And you can actually start to combine different round objects filled with water and lenses to build other optical systems. Whoa! So hold on. So I can build, so like take like a, a jug, like a big a beaker. Fish tank. Or whatever. A fish tank, yeah. something, But something spherical, like something like a cylindrical? Fill it with water. Uh, three dimension, not cylindrical, actually spherical. Like a spherical ball. Okay. Yeah. Right. And then there's flasks set... like this. Chemists have them. Right. Okay. And then set those up, and those will act like lenses. Yep. And I could just put one over here, one over there, look through, 
and and see the magnification. Wow, that's amazing. So now now what are what are, could we do with this these setups that isn't maybe a traditional telescope? Like could we go into a uh, you know, to magnify, we build a mag, you know, microscope. Yeah, this is the type of system that you can turn around and you you can build microscopes. And you know, my favorite random act of science is hard to do but amazingly fun. Is you can buy fluids that have um, itty bitty little teeny tiny particles in them. Um, fluids that have little latex balls. And you can set up microscopes so that you can look at the little micro, the little uh, latex balls in the microscope. Um, you can build what are called optical tweezers by shining laser light through one of these lenses and taking the, the beams of light that were previously parallel in that laser. And so you want to pull the laser back to a distance so the, the light is fairly spread out when it hits the lens. It'll focus it down to a point, and you can actually grab little tiny latex balls with radiation pressure. Wow. So it takes powerful green laser. Do not yeah. look at the green laser. Use absolute care with green lasers. Green lasers are dangerous. But you can focus it through a really good lens, the the lower the number of millimeters, the better, and um, grab things. So, you no, know, you recommended earlier Amazon.com, and that that also sounds like a great place. Like, if you're not, like, I think if you're trying to build a telescope that you want to use after you've done it, and you want to understand the fundamentals, and you want to build a telescope that's tough and rugged, and it's going to work well, Galileo scope. But if you yes. want to just build play. A, toolkit of crazy optic stuff amazon.com has has great they've just you know they've got like crazy in industrial chemicals and you know all that it's kind of stuff but you can find what all they have i know it's amazing but and because there's so much stuff that they resell and stuff but the gist is like go there and just you can pick up lenses of different focal lengths and different you know and and a lot of it is very inexpensive it's it's made for other purposes one last thing, uh, a source of lenses that uh, someone mentioned to me, uh, uh, Dave Dickinson, was uh, photocopiers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they have, you can dig out, if you've got like an old dead photocopier, if you can get your hands on one, they have lenses inside of them that you can use, and they, you can use those to build telescopes with. And, and one final, since we brought up lasers and CDs, well, you brought up photocopiers, and my brain went to DVD player. Um, if you take... A old CD, like the AOL ones that we used to all get in the mail, or some CD that's scratched so it doesn't really work anymore, a CD you don't care about the fate of, and a laser, you can reflect the laser off of the CD and create a diffraction pattern on the wall. So you can see all the different spiky separations. And if you do some math um, and, and you think really hard, and this is one of those things I need to write up to put on our website, um, you can actually calculate how much data can be stored on a CD by measuring the separations in the grooves, which you can calculate from the size of the diffraction spikes. Cool. So, can you make a telescope out of a CD? I don't think you no. can. You can make a spec spectroscope sort of, kind of, ish. All right. Well, now I'm going to pull the trigger. It's time to wrap this episode <laughs> up. So next next week we will continue this conversation, but we're going to get serious. We're going to get we're going to build like we're going to walk you through building a legit telescope that you can actually use for observing in astrophotography. Um, and yeah, and it's a it's an amazing hobby. <laughs> Start with the lenses and the styrofoam and the toothpicks and yeah, yeah. You you do just not just to, you do not save any money building your own telescope. <laughs> no, that is that is clear. So all right, well thanks again, Pamela, and we'll talk Thank to you, you next week. Okay, <laughs> bye bye. File save. Yes, save. Really, yes, save. No, seriously, save. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh.
Oh, my hard drive's almost full again. Right. <laughs> I hear the dog. Yeah, I'll banish her. Okay, I'm now uploading. All right, let me see what we've got for questions, comments, feedback. I'm using my holiday season to do all the horseback riding, and standing up was harder than anticipated. Cole Palmer says hello. Hey, Cole, how's it Hi. going? Hi. Uh, okay, Russell Bateman suggests Surplus Shed, which is another great source for lenses. Okay. I haven't heard of that. Okay. Um, Maltesh Natovny says, I had a Galileo scope with a nut to attach the thing to the tripod, tore through the plastic. I haven't used it in a couple of years. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, so I can see what that is. So it's yeah. like this guy. So you should be able, what, what I would do is put the nut where it should be and um, use epoxy to fill it in. And if you want to make it so that your telescope can still come apart, when you're putting the epoxy in, put wax paper going in where the joint is so the epoxy can't get in to the joint. The other thing that you might want to do is uh, we've built some tripod mounts and you can, it's it's a very standard size. Yeah, it's a quarter twenty. Yeah, and so you can get that, you can get one of these like a uh, a nut that will fit that, and then you could sort of scoop this part out, and then put like your own little plate in, and and hook it up, and it should be able to work. So, so just a little, you know, little fix. I wonder if you can buy. Can you buy that spare part, or could you buy the spare? Are the places we can get spare Galileo scope parts? Um, that would require a completely new tube, and honestly, doing something even as simple as like. Filling that space in with air hardening clay and then using your thumb to press in a bolt, that would totally work too. Yeah. Just, yeah, or just get another one. Because um, then you got spare parts. Okay. Uh, Jamie McIlvaney asks, uh, with all the different kinds of telescopes across the spectrum, which is most useful for astronomy nowadays? Rishi Kretian. Yeah. Which is just fun to say. It's, it's seriously though, it's a type of telescope that doesn't necessarily have a huge field of view, but its field of view is extremely in focus across the entire field. It's a complex mirror to grind because it's not a spherical mirror, and so they weren't used very much early on. But as we've gotten better and better at mirror fabrication. Um, it's the type that gets used the most often. It, it has a mirror in the base, shoots the light up to a secondary mirror that isn't flat. I don't remember its shape, I'm sorry. And then brings it back through the front to a Cassegrain focus. Um, and this is where you hear Schmidt Cassegrain tells you right off the bat that it's a spherical mirror with a corrector lens. Um, or not, and then you have aberration. Um, a Rishi Kretian Cassegrain is again one where the light gets focused through the back end of the telescope. But I think, you know, I think what Jamie's asking though is also across the spectrum. So like what do astronomers, even professional astronomers, what are they using these days? And they're they're really going towards infrared now. Um well that's because I mean, it all depends you've on who, fallen you know, who you prey are. to the James Webb Space Telescope propaganda. Um yeah, okay, we they sure have. <laughs> and the wise, and the, you know, all these Well, we've just had a, a whole series of infrared orbital telescopes. James Webb is going to be the next. And your video is completely frozen, so I'm hoping you're still there. I'm still here. Can you okay. hear me? Okay, yes, yes. So Somebody's um, probably doing a microwave in the house. <laughs> But uh, we need telescopes that work across the entirety of the spectrum. And so where you hear all the James Webb Space Telescope propaganda, that is in counterpoint to the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is an optical telescope. Um, and then we have Alma, which is a millimeter telescope. And so here we've pegged 
very long, uh, and then if you go out to SKA, even longer. So we have SKA longest, Alma shorter, James Webb sh uh, shorter, Large Synoptic Survey Telescope even shorter, and luckily right now we have a good suite of ultraviolet and X-ray and gamma ray telescopes that are doing a solid job, but I'm sure those are going to be the next things we need to rebuild. As technology progresses, we're like, ooh, this one's out, out of date. Need to replace the obsolescent But, but what telescope. about visible, right? Like that's the one that people don't really focus on too much anymore. Yeah, we do. Well, well no, I mean, synoptic I mean, survey is optical. Sure. I mean, I guess the part of the thing, I guess I'm thinking space telescopes because, you know, well, and, in and so space what, is where you need, you know, you need things to be cool and you want infrared or you need to be able to get above the atmosphere and that's what you need for... There, there's a lot of astronomy that takes place from the ground. Yes. Yes, I... And, and, and for launching things into space because we have adaptive optics now... Um, we can do so much from the ground that would simply way too much to do in space that we're investing in things like the Europeans are bringing, building the extremely large telescope. Um, they have the very large telescope already. Uh, we work with Gemini North and South. All of these different ground-based massive telescopes they work in the optical and the near infrared, and they're just kicking butt. Um, ultraviolet and infrared, you really need to do in in space because not all the wavelengths get through our atmosphere. X-ray and gamma ray are hopeless from the ground. Right. Um, oh, here's a good question. So Robert Scott Herrick asks. Uh, oh, by the way, if you're wondering like how we're doing this, these questions, where is this happening? We're using the Q and A app that's built into YouTube. So no matter where you're watching this, there should be a thing like we're answering questions live right now. If you click that, then you'll be able to come in and, and see the questions that are queued up. You can vote on the questions that you want. And I'm literally starting with the most voted question and moving down. So that's And and I'm watching thing. Twitter. Oh Twitter, okay. That's a thing still. Um, okay. So Robert Scott Herrick asks, another question about glasses. What are some tips you can offer for trying to use telescopes, binoculars, if you need glasses? So, so one of the things to remember is you can adjust the focus on telescopes and binoculars. And in a lot of cases, just take... Uh-oh. I love her face. Look at that. That's a good face. Allow me to answer this question for Pamela. <laughs> I'm back. I'm look back. At, look at you. Before you disappear, check out the face you're left with. I, I can't. You can't it, see it? Okay. All right. No. Um, <laughs> I should screen grab <laughs> It's pretty funny. Okay. You don't like me. Uh, it's, there, you, it's, it's the moment <laughs> it captured your face for the last second before you froze. It is, it is a very... Unflattering face, I will admit. Okay. I'm sure that you will make it the cover art for this video <laughs> later because that's I'm working what you on it do. right now. I'm working on it right now. Um, no. so, 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 what I was going to say is just take your glasses off and refocus it for your eyes. Get rid of that extra piece of optics. Right. You're, you're whatever it is, if you're nearsighted, you're farsighted, it is just an issue with the lens in your eye, and that, and you can. What will look in focus to you will will not look in focus to somebody else, but it doesn't matter because it's it's just for you. It's your telescope. It's your telescope. But the but but if a person has astigmatism, that's not the case. They have yeah. to use their glasses. Yeah. One one of the really awesome things is a lot of people who are so seriously ser seeing impaired that they're considered legally blind, can't read many other things, because the light to dark contrast is so great through telescopes, they can often make out things like Saturn and the crescent moon and the crescent Venus. And so while a lot of the low contrast daytime world is gone to them, they can still look through a telescope and perceive something. Sweet. Um... Subject line says, I have many old pairs of glasses. I'm long-sighted in one eye and short-sighted in the other. What can I make? Many old pairs of glasses. So could subject line use these old pairs of glasses to make Yeah, telescopes? totally. Um, so one of the things that is going to make it harder or easier is 
it'll be easier if you don't have astigmatism because that often will cause them to grind the lenses asymmetrically. Um, and the closer to round or the closer to being the same version after version ver after version of glasses, the shape of your glasses is, you, you may need to actually play with rotating the glasses to get things in focus. I, I wonder if anybody makes telescope lenses, f telescope eyepieces for astigmatism. Like, I wonder if you could submit... I, I think that 3D printing isn't good enough for that yet. Well, no, and just to get it custom, like you could, like just the way you can get a pair of glasses done. I wonder if you could get an eyepiece. Most like, eyepieces are five or six different lenses nowadays, and I think grinding those to all compensate for astigmatism. We're just not there yet. With three okay. D printing, I can imagine being able to pop corrector lenses on, but we're not there. I am. I am looking it up. Teleview. Dioptrics, astigmatism correcting lenses. That's not for the eyeball. That's for no, the, it's for the astigmatism. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Paul Gracie asks: Both in larger optics and copier optics are optimized for flat fields at short focal ratios. Would this make them difficult at infinite focus? So what you want to do is use them in, in parallel with something else that has a different type of focal lens. Right. And just muck around with it. Like, you know, try something. And then if that doesn't work, then try something different. Yes. You're not going to be making a great telescope here. You're just going to be playing. understanding, playing around with light. It's a great thing to do on a really gross winter day. It may cause your spouse or your teenage children to look at you like a crazy person. No way. But it's it a should... great way to, to getting, get involved uh, less cynical teenagers and small children. Um, oh, I already covered that one. Okay. Uh, Isaac Carroll says, I'm really excited about commercial space exploration, but I'm a bit skeptical about their ability to do science. What do you predict the scientific contribution will be of companies like Planetary Resources with their Arcid Space Telescope? It's really going to depend on how much they decide they want to give back. At, at a certain level, like planetary resources, they're off. They're going to be exploring asteroids. And just like it was because of geologists looking for oil that we found the giant crater in the Yucatan Peninsula, geologists looking for resources on asteroids are going to make discoveries about, well, if you see this, it means there's this. But when it comes to the basic research that ends up leading to discovering new types of crystals, discovering new types of, of impact created uh, minerals, um, that is going to require them releasing their scientists to spend a certain amount of time exploring for the sake of exploring. If companies do as, as Google has been known to do and release their employees to spend a certain fragment of their time doing research for the sake of research, we'll be in good shape. Yeah, I, you know, I'm a huge fan of, of this and what they're doing, what all the other groups are doing. And I think that, you know, in lots of other firms, lots of other fields. I mean, look at what Microsoft does. Look at what Google does. Look what IBM does. They they spend they spend a uh, you know a significant amount of their efforts on on pure research, on basic yeah. research, because those things that they're researching feed back into the products that they're developing. So so I think you're gonna see you're not you may not see the kind of science that you might expect if it was going to go through the National Science Foundation but you are going to see science that is going to be of value to scientists and and the people who are working on planetary resources are scientists and will have in their culture this sharing and contributing and giving back and i think there's and they're going to be publishing papers so you know because that makes them look better and so i think you're still going to see a lot of science it's going to be very specific as you said to the kinds of of geology and and aeronautics and the kinds of systems that they're working on, but you're still going to see a lot of science come out. And so it's better but to have the science than not, right? I, honestly, if they don't pay for it, no one's going to. We're exactly. seeing exactly, yeah, radical cuts. It, it. I was on a telecon or a webinar, I guess is the more accurate word, 
about an NSF grant a couple weeks ago. And it was the type of thing where afterwards you just go and contemplate drinking heavily or eating all the chocolate or doing both. Um, and, and the reason was it used to be that vast numbers of us scientists were funded 100% off of grants. I still am. And you'd get one or two grants that together would pay your whole salary. Well, NSF is now enforcing a rule that you can ask for no more than two months of salary per year. I don't know where to get the rest of my salary except to go to companies and I'm getting ready to start drafting letters because I don't know how to feed my team anymore. Yeah, so so science is going to get done and and as you said, you know, the, it's this weird time of all of these cutbacks in in all of the government funding. I mean, every time Casey Dreyer joins us on the weekly space hangout, I wince. He's from the Planetary Society, yeah. and his job is to bring us the bad news. He's like some kind of anti Santa Claus. Well, um, it's with the current planetary science budget, um, they're looking at roughly thirty percent of the money for salaries going away. That means thirty percent of the human beings doing planetary science are potentially going away and the ones most at jeopardy are people who are graduating right now and people whose grants just happened through some bad fluke be up for renewal this year. Yeah and so you look at like the Arctic Space Telescope like one of their priorities is going to be to um, to find all the asteroids because they're going to want to figure out which ones they should mine and which ones they shouldn't but while they're at it they're also going to map the position, speed, velocity, and potential danger of every one of these asteroids. And so as a, as a side benefit of them finding out where they should go mine, we're going to get all the asteroids that could kill us. And, and there's some, you know, or we're going to find out which asteroids are, you know, what percentage of asteroids are made of this component of metal and that percentage of rock. And, you know, as long as the data comes back out, like I really hope that, that they do have a free flow of ideas coming out of the out of their their research, like if they yeah. just hold on to it, that would suck. Which a lot of the oil companies do because it's a, right. it's a proprietary information, right? They're like, well, we only can be the ones who know where our oil deposits are. We're not going to tell you because then you would just come and drill in our spot. So, so that's <clears throat> that's my only concern is just that there isn't a, a sharing of information. Yeah, uh, it's let's... complicated. <laughs> it is complicated. Uh, Pretty Bish asks, do you need a powerful scope to see Betelgeuse? Just these. Yeah, just your eyeballs. They're good. And I have uh, Red5 2013 on uh, Twitter asking, what are the benefits, if any, of having telescopes on the moon? And it depends on where on the moon you put the telescope and what wavelength. Sticking a radio telescope on the side of the moon that's opposite the planet of the Earth, the far side of the moon, uh, that's a great place to put it because it allows the moon to be the buffer zone between the telescope and all of the radio signals the Earth is creating. When it comes to optical telescopes, it's not entirely useful because every part of the moon is in sunlight for half a month. Um, so you have less of thermal issues that you have to deal with and you don't get to always observe. But for radio telescopes, there's been a lot of talk of sticking one on the far side. Except for um, these, there's this idea that you can you know, use these big, I guess it's still radio, but you could, you could like rotate, build rotating um, mirrors, liquid mirror telescopes on the moon in the low gravity. <clears throat> that if you take a big pool of mercury and you get it rotating, as it rotates, the the mercury will will sort of this the centripetal force will push the outsides up, and you'll get a perfect lens. And and we build those on Earth, or at least we used to. But the whole mercury part is is kind of why we stopped building them on and, Earth. So and get it to the moon. Right. One one of the concerns with something like that is, and we talked about this some in the last show, is moon dust is evil. And oh. here we have problems on Earth with normal dust and debris getting into the Mercury mirrors, and lunar dust is just ugh. it's gritty and glassy and gross. Um, okay. Chris Bamford says we should mention the dangers of playing with lasers. We have, we did. Don't yes. play with lasers except lasers are awesome. 
so use be careful. absolute caution, especially with the green ones. What I tell my kids, because you know we have a green laser, and I say this is like a gun, right? Treat this as if this was a gun, and if you whatever you pointed it at dies, that's and it's you know, and that's we'll teach them if we ever start using guns. So, you know, they're already prepared. They're pretty scared, actually. They're pretty terrified to go anywhere near the laser. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, Guido Bibra says, don't knock the small Newtons. We love our little 76 by 700, good for the moon and the planets, and with the 12.5 eyepiece and a Chutez Barlow, you can get quite close, and it only... Oh, Newtonians are fabulous. Newtonians built out of cosmetic mirrors yeah. are not. Yeah, exactly. So the only ones we're knocking are the ones made out of cosmetic mirrors, and it's just a matter of those surfaces are horrible. Yeah. Um... Jogminder Sandu asks, what is your favorite camera? Oh, I love my Canon, and I don't have nearly as good a one as you. I just have a Canon T3i. Um, I have fantasies of someday upgrading to one that will like include the GPS coordinates of where the picture was taken in the photo yeah. headers. Um, but Canon cameras are awesome. If you go to my, to my YouTube channel, to the Universe Today YouTube channel, and you see the video explainers that we're doing, that is, these are all done with the same camera, with that Canon T3i camera. We haven't even started using my new camera yet. It's astonishing how good quality these things are. And for doing, um, you know, time-lapse stuff and nighttime stuff and, you know, get the Milky Way. It, it's, a, it's a fabulous camera. You can still get them, and you often get them on sale. So, yeah, the, the Canon T3i is a, you know, in my opinion, like one of the best value cameras ever made. It's and phenomenal. And there's a bunch of really good lenses that are affordable for it. That's, that's one of the problems that I've run into is looking at things and the lenses cost more than the camera body. Yeah. But I picked up a planetarium lens for, I want to say, $600, which for a planetarium lens is is utterly reasonable and all the rest of my lenses I've just waited and stocked them on Amazon and pretty much all of the ones I've gotten have popped under $200 at least for an hour or two. Yeah, same with mine. My uh, my go-to lens, we have a 35 millimeter 1.4 lens and it was uh, $400 which, you know, it's a Roka there's, a there's a whole class of lenses from Rokinon and they're just fantastic. Yeah. They're, but they're manual everything, so it's like manual aperture, manual focus, but but they, but it's just a boatload of glass. So I, I highly recommend the Rokinon lenses. Yeah, I think my 300 millimeters, like, in, yeah, it's it's the strange that that is my 300 millimeter lens, and my camera is right there. And so as you were as you were saying, I just got a, I bought a uh, 5D Mark II. But I actually haven't gotten my hands on it yet. Jay, the cameraman, is still playing with it. So, so at some point, probably in January, I'll get. He's going to come back over here, and we're going to shoot, and he will have learned how to use it, and then I'll, it's going to stay here. And then that's what I'm going to be starting to take my next set of pictures with. Cool. Um, we've got a little more time left. Okay, so uh, it's Christmas. Are you in a rush? <laughs> Not really. Okay, Mark Feinwood asks, uh, could there be lenses in old photographic enlargers that could be used for telescope making? Probably. I I don't know. Yeah, I, I grew up in the darkroom. My dad is a professional photographer, and uh, and I know what he's talking about, that you, there's this sort of a series of lenses, and and then you project, you, you, you put the film up, and then you project the image down onto the table below, and then you can change the size of the image that, that then projects your, your photograph. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, probably. I mean, if it's projecting an image with a lens, it's... It's so, work. so what I worry about those is those are lenses that are diverging lenses, and you want a converging lens for a telescope. So, so right, light so going through be... a lens can either converge or diverge. Right. And converging comes to a point, and diverging sort of falls apart. Um, diverging is great for making bigger stuff, but so not microscope. Yeah. But, you know, could you then take the light from that and use it to, like, project onto a wall? I don't know. You know what? Play. Play around. Don't ask us. Send us a picture of your mad machine. Or um, at least send us a question that includes words like convex, plano, concave, double, whatever, and 
numbers, and it's it's easier that way. Uh, Nora Kisher Brown says, "Happy solstice." I mean, that is astronomical, and happened on Saturday. Yes. Happy solstice! Happy <clears throat> Finally, we battled and back mess. against the winter. Yeah. Newton's birthday and Christmas are the same day in Western culture. Eastern yeah. Orthodox, it's not the same day. Western. That's perfect. It is. Yes. We should put up our. We should set up our Newton tree. My husband built a guitar tree. Of because he's got so, so many guitars. Like, what else could he do? Um, okay. Uh, Jeff Setzer says the Celestrian Power Seeker 70 AZ is 39 to 49 at Walmart, and it's quite decent. Not worth its list price, but for the price of a GS, it comes with a tripod, diagonal, and red dot finder. Yeah, I would go. Hmm. I would go with a Galileo scope over the Power Seeker. Yeah. I mean the seventy the seventy AZ that's the, that's their um their refractor I think it's their seventy millimeter refractor and I would do their refractor their little refractor over their little reflector. Why right? they, they do sort of a Newton one that's like a yeah. four and a half inch one and I for that size for portab like if you're gonna have like a quick little telescope you're gonna bring out you're gonna set it up that one's pretty okay but but if you're if you're at that price I go with um, the Celestron. Celestron First scope. I've got a first scope. I'm not a fan of it. Yeah. So here. Astronomers Without yeah. Borders has a telescope that Celestron's making for that's them. My, that's my that first scope. They swear by. Yeah. yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not a big fan. It's just not enough. It's it's just too underpowered. It's it's like three inch, three inches, and it's just it's just not enough. Um, so I, you know, I find like when when I show it to people and we put the highest magnification lens in, it's just, you know, like that that sad. I can't see it. Those are the rings, of, you know, those so are the rings. I can't quite see them. So it's just, you know, it's it's not my favorite. Yeah, the telescopes that that Celestron's making for Astronomers Without Borders are much higher end. Okay, yeah. Um, so no, someone actually just asked me this question, and they did the same thing. Like, should I get the Power Seeker? Should I get something like that? And the one that I recommend is if you're gonna if you're looking to spend that price, you want to give somebody a nice experience. Go binoculars. Go with the, the you know, at that weight, they've got like a 15 by, no, they got like a 25 by by 75, a 20 by 75. There's like a there's one that's sort of in that same price range. And it's it's a significant pair of binoculars, really heavy, big lenses, and you do want to be sitting on like a nice, comfy, you know, you want to you sit on a nice. You can stick them on a tripod. Yeah, I you can put them on a tripod, tripod, but or just like you know, if you're going to put it out, like something you want to set out on your deck, like sit out there with a nice pair of binoculars, you know, lean back in your Adirondack chair, and then and then show people like, hey, go take a look at that, and they're like, oh my god, that's Saturn. And you're like, yes, it is, it is Saturn, and that that they're. There's enough magnification in them that you can see those rings. That two eyeballs is so nice with 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 looking at things in the sky, and they're so easy to move around. Like if you're looking for that first telescope, that's the way to go. Yeah. So if you're if you're looking to spend under a hundred dollars, either binoculars or Galileo scope. Um, if you're looking for Really, the two hundred dollar mark is as cheap as you want to go for a telescope, and at the two hundred dollar mark, you're looking at the one scope Dobsonian, which Celestron puts together for Astronomers Without Borders. Um, you can get that at the Astronomers Without Borders website or any of the Orion Dobsonians, which you can get at Orion or you can get at Oceanside Photo and Telescope. Yeah, because <clears throat> like I think. You know, we've always recommended, I have to have some binoculars here, like we always recommend people use binoculars, right? So here's yeah. my, you know, this is what you probably have around the house, right? You might have the next size up, like this is the little guy, and then you might have, you've got you've got a, a bigger version, yeah. So what are yours? So so these are my 8x40, have traveled the world with me because they fit in my carry-on. I adore these. I do want to get a good pair of 10x50s, but those won't fit in my carry-on nicely. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I just think like even going bigger with like the fifteen, like a fifteen by seventy-five. I'm trying to remember the one that I was. I think it was like a, it was a twenty. Anyway, you know yeah. they were big. They were sizable. You're not going to travel with them. <clears throat> They're going to sit out on your, you know, right out by your deck. And when it's when it's evening and there's something interesting in the sky, you're going to go and lay in the chair and you're going to look in the sky. And that's, I think, that's what I really recommend. Jeff has come back. He says he has them all. Trust me, the Celestron Semi AZ is better than the Galileo Scope or the first. I would agree. I think, yeah. you know, I think it's a it's a it's a reasonable first telescope. But I just find that in many cases. Trying to let a person look through a little telescope like that is just kind of a pain. So this is a whole other. I mean, we could have a whole great big battle. This is a could, religious debate at this point. This is point. bordering on a religious debate for sure. It, and it's in the fact, Windows Linux OS X debate. Uh, our good friends at uh, Deep Astronomy, so Tony Darnell and 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 his team did a poll. They they brought in a bunch of the people from the Virtual Star Party. And they just, like, what's the best first telescope? And they went through the whole process. So if you haven't already, go check out uh, the Deep Astronomy YouTube channel. And on there, they have this this conversation, and they, they go on about it. Okay. I think, um, okay, Leonard Lindstrom asks, why not a spotting scope, monocular? Uh, because stereo, and you, you said stereo vision doesn't, I don't know, um, there's Using no contest. Using actually does help. Your brain processes things better. Yeah. And when your brain sees only one faint thing in one eye, it sort of goes, meh. If it sees the faint thing in both eyes, it's it somehow copes better. Here we go. Will I will I want you to say it's the Celestron Skymaster 15 by 70. That's the one. So 15 by 7. 15 okay. magnification, 70 millimeter lenses. The thing is a monster. It's 70 millimeters this direction lenses. Yes. So the front of... Yeah. And, uh, and I've seen them for under $50. So you know, normally I think they're list, they're 99 and I've seen them on sale for as low as like 40 So Okay. Yeah. Um, and Jeff, what do you think? Come back at me. Celestron 70 AZ or the... Uh, or the Celestron Skymasters. Um, okay, let's uh, let's go to some of the other locations for some questions. Nothing on Google Plus because they've Nothing all on Twitter. they've all gone into the uh, into this conversation to the questions hangout. Actually, let me um, scroll down and check the other place on Twitter. Um, nope. Andrew, Andrew Planet says if you place uh, glass optics on the floor, they can't fall and break. Good point. I have dogs. There's nothing worse than getting a nose print off of optics. Actually, no. Horse snot is worse. Sylvan Vespi says, uh, what's the better affordable guide scope now? What do you like as an affordable guide scope? You know, honestly, I've always used one of the, and I'm totally forgetting the name of it right now. It's It looks like this crazy box with like a prismy thing at the front, and what it does, there's no magnification involved. It uses a set of circles to allow you to look through, and you basically can target on on what you're finding. And as someone who learned my way around the sky by eye, I like this because I I can like point my telescope at the place where the object should be. If I'm having a really bad day, you can actually look through that thing with binoculars and it still works. <laughs> and and then it lines up with your eyepiece. So you're learning the sky by eye and also learning the sky by telescope. Um, I know people with 20-inch daubs that use 8-inch Celestrons on the back end as finding scopes. <laughs> right. I tried uh, hooking up a laser. I tried hooking up my laser and played around with that because you can, you know, you point the laser in the sky and then wherever the laser is pointing and then you look through the eyepiece and that's what you're looking at. So um, it did, however, look a little weird. Um, Uh, Russell Bateman has posted a picture of a telescope that he built. You're awesome, Russell. By the way, check out Russell's feed. He's got some beautiful pictures, so he, he's legit. He knows his stuff. Um, Corrado Topi asks, are you going to publish the Hangout? It's so very interesting, but it's family dinner down here. Yeah, all yeah. the Hangouts that we do are fully available, archived forever. Um, Astrosphere, Astrosphere vids. vids. Yeah, and if you haven't already, take a second, go to Astrosphere Vids. Just search for Astrosphere Vids on Google, 
and you'll find the YouTube channel and you can subscribe to that and then you'll see as all of the, the new episodes are posted. Also, this stuff first comes out on the Universe Today channel because this is how it has to work. Yes. So also subscribe to the Universe Today YouTube channel. And that's where you get all my cool explainer videos. So um, I'm all out of questions. Oh, wait. Isaac Carroll says the word is anti-penultimate. And A-N-T-E penultimate. So that's the, the day next before. next to the last. The next to the next to the last. Right? Yes. Penultimate is the, la is the next to the last. Anti-penultimate is the next to the next to the last. Um, I think that's the okay. way My brain was having a philosophical debate with itself over whether Christmas Eve was the next to the last day or the last day. But that's a personal problem. You'll be all right. <laughs> I haven't um, done no Christmas shopping yet. Done. Can, uh, Jeff Seltzer says, can't see the rings of Saturn or moons of Jupiter with binoculars. Uh, with the 15 by 70s? I think you can. Um, yeah, actually with those you can. Yeah, that's that's why I was suggesting the 15. Like, like they are heavy and, and you know, you really need some Use support. A tripod. A tripod or lay back in a chair. But... But that's that's why I'm saying like for that if you want that kind of magnification I really do love the those larger because like as you said you know the Celestron 70 it's now you got two of them two 70 millimeter lenses not just the one um, okay well I think we've answered all of our questions so I think uh, I hope you guys all appreciate that Pamela as always thank you so much for bringing your brain thank uh, you. we really appreciate it and uh, <clears throat> have a great Christmas you too and and. and Tell your kids I miss seeing The Hobbit with them this year. Oh, they already saw it. Yeah. They they, they, they enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, and then we will, uh, and then we'll see you next Monday. So we're going to be great. doing uh, one final weekly space hangout for the year. We're going to do that on Friday, and, and I'm going to try and join on Friday. Yay! And we're going to do a wrap up. So we're going to cover all of the big stories that happen over the course of the year. Chelyabinsk and NASA budget cuts. And so if there's any suggestions, Pamela, uh, no, seriously, that is one of the topics we're going to yeah, be talking it's, about. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I, folks, I, I honestly, I, I at least twice a week right now have had the discussion with myself of, well, when we lose, not if, when we lose all of our NASA funding, I can always earn my living cleaning stalls at the barn. Because the funding situation is so dire, I've I've cut my salary because I'm married and I can to make sure that my staff is okay. Because we're, if you have money to give, if you have a company you can recommend, the grant that we rely on, we were supposed to renew two years ago, and it hasn't been offered in two years, and we just got word that it's not being offered again this year. Wow. The lunar grant that we go after, we just got a letter saying we still don't know if we're going to be able to issue these grants for this grant you applied for last February. Uh, we won't be able to tell you if you got this grant before this year's deadline, if this year's deadline goes forward. Um, the NSF said we can pay at most two months salary and we're funding no projects, only research. So that means we can't go to NSF to seek funding for CosmoQuest. Yeah. Okay. So if you haven't already, donate to CosmoQuest and uh, yeah. CosmoQuest.org slash donate. Sorry, I will stop shaking now. This is... Yeah, I could see I, kind of emotional about it. Yeah. Um, one last question. Uh, Cole Palmer wants to know what webcam are you using? Looks so oh, cool. uh, it's an awesome one by Logitech. It's their BT. Hold on, let me open up my preferences and it'll tell me the exact number. I adore this camera. It has zoom, it has steering. Um, it is simply fabulous. And that was not the most intelligent place to go to look for the information. I use it a Logitech a, 910C. It is the Logitech Conference Cam BCC 950. Cool camera. It's it's I I adore it. It, it lets cool. me do this. Joink. <laughs> That's awesome. You can now um, see how messy my desk is. 
And what's even more disturbing, come on, center, is I can zoom all the way out. I can zoom all the way in, which is terrifying. So this That's is, great. I love this. That's a great camera. I, I should get one too. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again, Pamela. Have a Merry Christmas. We'll see you on Monday, or we'll see you on Friday if, uh, if you have the time. And uh, thanks everyone for watching, and uh, we'll see you later. Bye-bye.